Welcome to the Creators here at Sun City. Coming to you every Tuesday and Friday. Extended conversations that build community making for creators videos, by art making what you make. Today on The Creators, Summersworth High School principal John Shea, formerly a founder of High Tech High School in San Diego, brings his desire to find a creative solution to the challenge of high schools that serve students today. So subscribe to our channel, comment, and most importantly, watch Building With Us as we build community with you. Welcome back to The Creators. Bill Rogers here being joined. Happy to... Uh, introduce John Shea. Good to be here, Good Bill. to see you. Thanks for, thanks for coming by. Thank you for having me. John is the new principal of Summersworth High School and uh, joined us just a, a, a month ago. Yep. So why Summer, well before that, this show is called The Creators and I'm kind of tipping my, uh, tipping my hand because I've invited you on a show called The Creators. So I'm, I'm thinking of you as a creator, but do you consider yourself a creator? What is that? What, does that have any significance for you? Um, I, I don't think creator is the word I would choose. If somebody said, what's the, uh, the adjective or the noun that best describes, I'd probably call myself an educator. Um, I'm honored uh, to be invited onto a show that's focused on creators. Um, uh, and if that's, you know, partly captures thinking creatively and differently about education or thinking creatively and different about almost anything that merits uh, uh, thinking a little harder about and potentially doing a little bit better or doing significantly better in some way or another, um, and then moving beyond thinking about it to doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, in the field of education, that's about collaboration and working together more than anything. Um, which I find pretty exciting. I think a lot of entrepreneurs and creators kind of, they got free reign because they're just doing their thing, whatever it might be, um, whether it's starting a business or as an artist or a musician. Um, but uh, th this is really about communities and faculties and kids and parents kind of working together, um, which makes it challenging, but is also what I think is one of the more rewarding aspects about being a creator in education. Sure, I, I see uh, that you got an MBA from from Harvard, uh, yes. so a, a master's of bu business administration or yes. bu business arts. Yeah. <laughs> um, did when you got that degree uh, from Harvard, a business degree, were you um, were you thinking of education at that point, yeah. or were you thinking of other endeavors? Uh, most individuals just assume that I was confused at some point or another, either pursuing it or what I did afterward. Um, I, I had worked in the nonprofit field before. Um, getting my MBA, um, you know, I was a, a mid-career kind of person, or I guess early, you know, I was 30-ish when I went back, or late 20s when I went back for my MBA. Um, at the time I went back, I was envisioning a graduate degree in, in leadership and in management and in organizational behavior that would lend itself to working in the nonprofit field, um, probably around youth development. Um, and. Uh, uh, the Kellogg and Yale and uh, there's a handful of other schools that offered nonprofit public sector specific programs um, and I was coming out of the nonprofit public sector so I was more interested in a general management program so that that was partly the allure of Harvard um, I hadn't lived in Boston I've lived a lot of different places in the United States and kind of enjoyed in my younger days uh, experiencing uh, different parts of the country so Boston was on my short list of places. Um, Harvard is obviously a quality program. Um, and uh, yeah, it all kind of clicked and fell into place. Um, and it was a really rewarding program um, in terms of what I took away from that. And, and they make a, you know, I'd probably say about 10% of the student body um, by um, del deliberately is uh, the odd people like myself that are coming from the nonprofit or the public sector. Overwhelmingly, it's private sector folks. But uh, I used to joke that I was kind of there for the private sector guys because they needed the handful of us with the different experiences to add to their education. Um, and I say that kiddingly because uh, I obviously, um, you, you can't do really much of anything um, uh, that's systemic 
or overarching um, that does not involve the private sector. Um, operating the nonprofit sector or public sector um, narrowly, you can do some things, but if you're talking about systemic stuff um, like education, everybody's got to be at the table, and the private sector is a huge part of that. So why Summersworth, New Hampshire? I see uh, Panama, headmaster of a private school, or a division of a private school, um, San Diego, um, why principal of a uh, relatively small high school in New Hampshire? My, uh, my wife and I and our kids have been settled in uh, the seacoast area of New Hampshire since 2002. Um, we did go abroad for a bit, but this is, what, now 16 years here. Um, we came here because we had a conversation one day um, when I was with the High Tech High Charter School in San Diego. We had our second daughter. And I came home and uh, said to my wife, who had also moved around and lived and taught in Namibia, um, are we just going to keep moving around or are we going to pick where we want to live and uh, raise our kids there? And it was actually, we went back and forth about it and we both settled on, um, let's, uh, let's live in one community. And we explored uh, different parts of the country, took our time and fell in love with Portsmouth um, and, and this whole area. So we've been here for the last 16 16 years now, um, with a little bit of time abroad, but with the intent of coming back. Um, and uh, and why, to me, high school, I'm, I'm a high school principal. I'm not interested in being a superintendent. I love teaching. I could just as easily teach at the high school level as be a principal at the high school level. Um, I'm immensely attracted to both, but I think my skill set and my passions line up pretty well with what it means to be a principal. Um, what are... I so yeah. I was just and I and just said for me and I, there's been a lot of research done on this and, and a couple of schools I was involved in starting 400 to 600 students is kind of the sweet spot for a high school hmm. um, the small schools movement there's a lot of Gates fund foundation money behind this about 10 15 years ago it sort of kind of petered out um, but that said uh, you know forget what's trendy or what's the focus at a given point um, for a lot of good reasons. Um, once you in that 500 ish student realm gives you the critical mass you need for theater and arts and advanced level courses. Um, you can't pretend to be a comprehensive high school with every program under the sun, but you can do the basics pretty well. When you get under 400, when you get down 300, 250, you sometimes don't have the critical mass to do certain kinds of classes um, to offer another language um, to put together a band, a concert band. Um, 400 to 600, 500 ish, um, you get that critical mass and you get community. Um, when you get over 600, 700, 800 students, it becomes really, really difficult to have the sense of community, the sense of family, the sense of connection. Um, I've been a principal and I've taught in high schools where most adults in the building can't even pick out whether or not a student should be in the building or not. At Cambridge and Latin, we had 2,300 kids. Um, really wonderful school, but to say there's a sense of community across 2,300 uh, students is a bit of a stretch. So that part of uh, Summersworth is really attractive to me. But I'll tell you the singular thing, you know, aside from, yeah, let's, I wasn't doing an international search because this is home. So I was looking at what's available in this uh, area. And what really was exciting about Summersworth to me is a commitment from the school board, a commitment from the uh, outgoing interim superintendent, a commitment from the incoming new superintendent, and an overwhelming sense from the faculty that we need to be do we need to be doing much better. And I don't mean Summersworth; I mean high school as mm -hmm. we know it. An openness to kind of think, thinking, uh, rethinking some of the assumptions about what high school is. And for me, that that's Portsmouth High School, uh, Phillips Exeter Academy. Berwick Academy, St. Thomas, Marshwood are all basically structurally the same, Summersworth included. And there's very few schools really breaking away from some of these critically old assumptions that make it harder, not easier, for kids to learn, that make it harder, not easier, for teachers to do what uh, makes the most sense. Um, I think what happens that is powerfully good in high schools like Summersworth High School happens because good teachers and hardworking kids with support of their parents are pulling out of a system what they can, and they're getting, getting out of it what they can despite the way high school is structured, not because of the way high school is structured. In your uh, Piscataqua TED Talk, you talked about uh, concerns about, about education and, and talked about the industrial background yeah. of our educational system, the Bells as one example. Yeah. Uh, time for work. Yeah. Um, what, what attracts you to, uh, 
to doing something different and what's your hunch about what that might be the um i i stumbled into cambridge engine latin high school um when i was about 31 or 32 as a volunteer and then as a teacher and then as a creator of a program um, and so I hadn't been trained in the traditional ways around what high school education ought to be. Um, the the, Larry Rosenstock was the administrator that brought me on board there, and he's recognized that that's what we need. Um, so I kind of came at it from a very common sense perspective about, um, you know, what makes sense for young people um, uh, to, to be grappling with and what are the best ways to teach it. Um, which unfortunately, um, most teacher education programs prepare teachers for the schools we have rather than preparing teachers for the schools we should have. Um, so from the beginning, I've been struck. Uh, my own high school experience and every high school I've been a part of as a volunteer, or as a teacher, as an administrator since, um, it's automatic for me to look around and see what's happening. I love the good that's coming out of it. I'm dismayed by um, the untapped potential that we don't reach because of the way that we've kind of set things up. So it's just kind of in me that um, recognizing that we're coming up short. And, and I love working in the high school environment. I love working with faculty. I love working with kids. I love working with their families um, to kind of make this work. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like if it was a three-year-old in the middle of the street and there's traffic coming, you wouldn't say to somebody, why would you run out there and get them out of the street? It's just automatic. Um, that's as, as automatic as this is uh, for me. And the, the history, I think a lot of people don't understand the, um, the history here. Um, the, the structure of the American high school is essentially about 120-ish, 125 years old. If you go back into the late 1800s, um, only a small percentage of uh, kids actually went on to high school, uh, maybe 10% or so, um, depending on the year that you track it. It was, you know, basically... Uh, young people got through what the equivalent of a middle school education, then you just went to work. And it was this really noble, ambitious effort to kind of ramp up our public education system and said, shouldn't all kids be getting the equivalent of a high school education? And then they can figure out what they're going to do next. So we designed a system, turn of the century, 100 plus years ago, at the heart of the Industrial Revolution, really, um, that was aimed at producing workers, not thinkers, followers, not leaders, um, creative creators. Are you kidding me? No, it was just we we needed good, responsible citizens that kind of did what they were told, could work on an assembly line, um, could rise through the ranks to managerial levels. But there wasn't anything about problem solving, creative thinking. No. So the, the, what people need to understand is the system that was designed 100 plus years ago was not designed for teaching and learning. We almost knew nothing about teaching and learning. It was simply an industrial revolution factory model that was, it was aimed at ramping up our public education system and efficiently, efficiently getting kids through four years of education. Um, and it was a very delivery-based system. Um, you sit there passively, and I'm going to lecture at you, and you get out of it what you can, and you're going to have to work really hard to get stuff out of it. Um, and a lot of kids didn't get much out of it. Um, it w it's never been a good system. It, is ne it was never a good system. But just through the 1950s, 1960s, maybe even in the 1970s, it was tolerable. Not good, but tolerable. And then with the global economy and the advances in technology and the world we live in today, where problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration are essential skills, we're still trying to pull those out of a, uh, an education model that has nothing to do with teaching and learning. The way we organize the curriculum, the way we grade and assess, the way we move kids through the school, none of it is actually grounded in sound educational teaching and learning practices. But we are just ridiculously ingrained and stuck in it because it's the system you went through, it's the system I went through, it's the system parents went through. There's only a handful of high schools in this. I think there's close to 40,000 high schools in this country. There's a lot of small schools. Um, maybe 100 of them, and I'm being optimistic, are really, really pushing the boundaries of uh, how we organize curriculum, thinking differently about grading and assessment, um, how kids go through the system. Um, even, even simple things like uh, ninth graders, 10th graders, 11th graders, and 12th graders. 
um, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors. There is absolutely no educational reason, and, and in fact, it's a hindrance and a harm that we organize kids for bizarre reasons into those for like, you know, if you think about the fact that the idea of a high school diploma is supposed to mean you've learned some things and are ready to move on, and at Summersworth High School, you know, you figure we got about 500 students. Um, are they all exactly the same, learning at the same pace, learning the same things? It's kind of, it's a pretty radical idea to assume that they come into ninth grade, all different places, all different styles, all different interests, and they're all going to get to the finish line at exactly the same time. They get to the finish line at exactly the same time because the finish line doesn't really mean much. They're just kind of punching the clock and then they're on their way. It isn't to say kids don't pull a lot out of high school, but they pull out what they can despite the way we've structured it. Um, so there's a lot that really merits kind of thinking more carefully about. Jumping back to uh, your your work at Cambridge Ringe, yep. Latin. Um, what was your position there? What, what kind of stuff were you doing? I was. Uh, it was in my second year of business school. Um, the uh, if, if there's time for, I'll tell you the story how I got connected to it. Um, the my second year in business school. Um, at that point, I was imagining. I had spent the summer between my first year and second year in Colorado. Um, playing a small part and helping to get an alternative school started in Estes Park, Colorado, outside of Estes Park called the Eagle Rock School, working with a gentleman named Robert Burkhardt, a uh, very small part, and also helping to start a service corps program like City Year called Year One in Denver. Um, and then I came back to my second year of business school realizing um, if, if I, my focus at that point was I, thinking in terms of all the things young people need outside of school. Um, and beginning to rethink maybe if high school was more of what it should be, um, the need for some of these things outside of school wouldn't be so significant. And this was a time when there was a lot of entrepreneurs like Wendy Kopp and uh, Alan Brown, uh, Alan Casey and Michael Brown starting City Year, late 80s, early 90s, a lot of social entrepreneurship, um, a lot of expensive social entrepreneurship where they're looking for additional funding to start extra programs. And it kind of hit me that schools is probably, schools are already funded and that's where all the kids are. Um, and maybe that should be our focus. So I had kind of uh, been pondering. I walked across the Cambridge Ringe and Latin campus every single day from I, where I lived to my classes. Um, and as I was thinking this through, I finally one day walked in um, and uh, suggested I tried to track somebody down, said, is there a volunteer role for me? Um, and then about a day later, two days later, um, a couple of Cambridge Ringe and Latin students were arrested for murdering an uh, MIT student. Mm. who was a foreign exchange student um, from Scandinavia, mm. if I recall correctly. Um, and all these articles ran in the local paper about the kind of that town gown divine where you've got schools like Harvard and, and rough neighborhoods. Cambridge, pretty diverse, but some parts of it pretty rough. Yale, New Haven, there happens in a lot of places. Indiana University and the Breaking Away movie, which is wonderful, kind of captures that town gown thing as well. So I pushed a little harder about kind of getting involved at the school, um, and I eventually connected with Larry Rosenstock um, and, uh, and talked about, you know, different ways of thinking about um, how we educate kids and things that are happening outside of schools that maybe should be happening inside them. And that's when we designed a program to teach social studies, English, and technical arts. Um, social studies and English to meet graduation requirements, technical arts as an elective. Um, in a three-block class um, that would actually be a community problem-solving course um, that over the course of the year. So I designed it basically as a real world. If I've got 20 students um, and they're going to uh, do a needs assessment in the community, determine what needs to be addressed in the community, pick an issue, and then plan a way to address it, um, what's the curriculum behind that? And, and it's, it's, it was as real as it gets. And it's a very diverse high school, so sorted things out, and we got along. We had three or four different races represented in the class, a wide socioeconomic background, and everything from kids going to Ivy League schools to kids not going to college at all. Um, it, it was pretty powerful, and that was pretty much modeled off the whole city year idea, which is a diverse having diverse kids working together. Um, and then and from that point, and I don't remember what the question is now, Bill. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? What happened at Cambridge Ringe in Latin, which was me starting out. Um, kind of thinking I got to better understand high school to go do the things I want to do to just being like this is where I need to be mm -hmm. um, and uh, I went from teaching to administrating pretty quickly just because uh, and that was that was Larry's fault bringing me on to mm -hmm. high tech high and then uh, so that was my question yeah. let's transition into high tech high uh, what's the 
What's the idea behind this? Who's you, you guys sitting around? Uh, is he saying, "Hey, I'm thinking of doing this thing"? What's uh, what, what, what's going on? Most char and charter schools are public schools, but they're funded and chartered by the state rather than funded and uh, chartered by local community. Um, and and by law, they vary from state to state, but typically it's all tuition free, and they uh, admit kids by lottery, um, and they typically are. Over representative of uh, low income it depends on the community, but uh, we were we were definitely in that camp the, in terms of proportion of lower income uh, uh, kids and kids of color. Um, typically, a charter school, from my understanding, is a group of educators with an idea. They get the charter, and then they then form a board um, and recruit a board to oversee their school. Um, this, the high tech high school happened the other way. It was the high tech industry in San Diego, and particularly the Jacobs family. Erwin Jacobs started Qualcomm. He's a Massachusetts guy, that ended out there with his sons and his family, started Qualcomm, and they were among the businesses in San Diego um, getting frustrated with the fact that when they were looking for those, those STEM folks, science, technology, engineering, math background individuals, um, to come in at both entry level, middle level, um, higher level positions and experience, they were not finding them in the local community, they were not finding them in the United States, and they were regularly hiring from abroad. Um, so they were, the, they, they were the ones that said, wait a minute, what can we do about this? They were the ones that said, let's start a school, let's start a high school. Um, they, went, they got the charter with the state, with their vision, um, they put up the money to kind of get the startup in place. Um, and they found Larry and hired him to be their uh, CEO. Um, he was in San Diego. He had left the uh, Boston area and was in San Diego at, the, at a, the Price Foundation. So they brought him on board, which I thought is a pretty powerful and unique way for a school to start. Um, and then obviously he was central to Next Steps because they weren't educators, but they laid out the general vision. And that was a, a science, technology, engineering, math focused school, not exclusively, but that was at its core. And they specifically wanted lower income students who were underrepresented in these fields. They wanted uh, students of color who were underrepresented in these fields. And they wanted girls who were underrepresented in these fields at the school, which is beautiful because the driver initially was like, we need people um, with these skills. So it would have been easy for them to say, we don't care. Give us a whole lot of uh, higher income, socioeconomic. I don't care if they're all white kids or all this or they're all boys. Um, but they added that to their mission, um, and uh, I thought that was pretty exciting. At what point uh, did you start to work with them? At the formative stage? Yeah, Larry, I was the first one on board after Larry. Um, so it was about eight, nine months to start up. I was in Seattle at the time doing some work with Seattle Public Schools, teaching at the University of Washington, um, just a freshman seminars class, and, and getting my master's degree in education, um, given that that was not my undergraduate or in a uh, graduate experience until then, uh, program in educational leadership and policy studies. And uh, Larry contacted me. He asked me when I was going to be done. I said I was supposed to be done in June of uh, 2000. Um, he said, could you be done by December of 99? I went to see my faculty advisor and said, is there any way I can speed this up? And uh, she said, yep. So I, I finished uh, earlier than I had planned, um, earned my master's in education, leadership, and policy studies in December, um, started working uh, from Seattle a little bit in October, November, December, and then was down in San Diego in December. Um, and we opened uh, the following fall. Um, we. Uh, we had an administrative assistant, Cindy. It was the three of us for a little while. We hired um, a faculty of eight, I think, for the first year. Um, Larry and I wanted to start with ninth graders only and then roll forward. Um, the board was a little more anxious to get up to critical mass, so we started with ninth graders and tenth graders. Um, and that, that was fine because the tenth graders, come, having already experienced a year of high school, um, we're able to tell the ninth graders that were new to all this that don't worry, this may seem strange, but it's a lot better than what you what high school really uh, typically is. Um, and then we eventually grew to about 400 students. Um, and then uh, I was gone as it continued to. I moved back to New England as I described earlier, um, and I had agreed with Larry uh, at the beginning that I would help with the startup phase before. Um, uh, heading uh, probably back east. Um, the documentary film, um, uh, Most Likely to Succeed, uh, catalogs the experiences at High Tech High School a little bit later. I'm not sure when much they later. shot that. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, eight? 
No, the the documentary came out in 2015, and I think they probably shot it in the two or three two or three years prior. Mm -hmm. um, so it was long after. Um, I I left in 2002. I was there for the first three years, and then uh, um, it was several years later that that came about. It was pretty entertaining. Um, given the excitement around doing things differently in education, so long before we were accomplishing any of the things we had set out to do, um, the, we had everybody on the planet visiting the school and mm -hmm. uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think when he was running for governor of California before he was there, um, the uh, Joe Lieberman um, watched uh, the presidential debate between Al Gore and George Bush from our school. Um, uh, and so it was pretty fun. Our kids enjoyed all that because we definitely had a lot of folks coming through. I think Oprah Winfrey visited after mm -hmm. I was there. Um, I believe Bill Gates visited after I was there. Um, and not that that's a measure of how you're doing, but it adds some excitement and fun for the for the kids to recognize that there's some pretty powerful stuff happening. And how do you bring that? Uh, do you bring the experiences there uh, with a huge amount of, of support? Uh, do you um, do you bring that experience from the formative stages of high tech high school to what you do today? Yeah, in, I think in this community. I think I bring everything that I've done everywhere to what um, I'm doing now in Summersworth. Um, I'm not a fan of, I, I don't think um, the high tech high model is the model. Um, there was many aspects of it I adored that brought me down there, but there are also things, I've sat on a couple panels in the documentary and have been quick to question um, certain aspects of how the school developed and, just, and to quick to say, hey, I'm, actually, I don't agree with that. Um, and I have uh, my own ideas of what the ideal way to do high school is, but the, the head of that is the, the notion that a high school belongs to a community um, and a role as a high school principal or as a creator or as an advocate for change is to engage folks in that dialogue and to reach some decisions together um, about what makes the most sense. Um, and that takes a bit of work because uh, when you you know when you think about this endlessly um, and you're talking with folks that think about it a little bit um, and and kind of getting them up to speed um, and 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 being able to think it through thoughtfully and so that we can kind of figure it out together that's 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 that takes a little bit of work I don't have to get too intellectual about this but um, one of the thoughts I had in 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 both from your TED talk as well as in looking at most likely to succeed is what about the academic model in other words, uh, the normal school, the uh, industrial model of yep. how we develop workers yep. for, that, are, that are needed to make brooms and yep. whatever else they need to make. Yep. But what about the Harvard University academic model that's about 400 years old yep. uh, that says we look at the masters and learn from them and, yep. and, and get involved in a... Uh, in a conversation yep. about what we know and how we know it, and then we, yep. we kind of force that conversation, uh, Socratic conversation. Yes. Does that, how does that filter, does that have any bearing on how a high school can and should work? Um, and how do we, because that, that relates to this division of, uh, of disciplines. Yep. Um, and I think a lot of the attraction here is how can we, in, in a way, lower those walls so there's more uh, cross-pollinization between disciplines yep. to get real work done, yep. to answer real questions. Yep. Uh, that seems like one of the challenges moving forward. What, what's, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I got a lot of thoughts on that. Um, the, uh, the, the, you know, the Phillips Exeter Academy calls it the Harkness Table. It's fundamentally the Socratic method. Um, and, and Plato's, it's interesting because uh, Plato's idea was more about application. It's interesting. And when you look at the, and Aristotle's contribution, I think, was the weakest because he's the one that got everything organized uh, a little tightly around disciplines that we kind of got overly stuck with over the years. Um, but the, uh, the issue with the Socratic method um, or the, the idea behind it, it's not so much that it's the Socratic method. Um, here's the core. Um, are young people simply having information delivered to them or are young people engaging in the process of figuring things out for themselves um, 
secondarily, are they doing it in isolation of the real world or are they applying it in the real world? Um, both of those things are absolutely essential um, and, and rarely are they part of the traditional high school. So forget academic, not academic, whatever. Um, fundamentally, high school is a place that is overwhelmingly, not entirely, but overwhelmingly about the teacher delivering to the student the answers about the, you know, World War II. Well, why did it start and what were the implications? Um, the worst way of doing that is in a lecture. Here are the five reasons World War II started. Do, 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 take notes, take notes, memorize it. Here are the implications of World War II and how it ended that played out in Europe and the rest of the world over X number of years in the Cold War. Take good notes, listen, shut up, don't ask any questions, move on. That's the worst way to do it. The more powerful way to do it, um, which is still a step shy, is I'm going to teach them to you, but we're going to talk about them. I'm going to show you a video. We're going to move around. We're going to have some group discussions. But at the end of the day, you're going to learn them better. But at the end of the day, the, the, the reasons we had World War II and the implications of it were taught me to you. The Socratic method or constructivism and a lot of other things is about, hey, let's figure out why World War II happened. Let's figure out what led to Vietnam. I'm not going to tell you the three reasons you're going to memorize it. We're going to talk about it because there are not right answers. History is not black and white. Science isn't black and white. The most interesting mathematics aren't black and white. These are, you know, actually debating about ideas. So not only do the students learn it, but they learn how to figure things out. And that is what we need more of than, than anything, is the capacity to actually struggle with problems and, and pose good questions and tackle them. Um, so what it, it, we often think of it as a science kind of thing, but no, it, history, English. So the difference between you know, the old model of you're going to read all the great books, I'm, I'm going to teach you what they're about, um, and that way at a cocktail party when you're 50, you're not going to feel like a fool because somebody brings up the great Gatsby and you don't know any of the characters' names. or what. It, that's nonsense. Who cares what books you read? Let's find good, powerful stories. And the joy is engaging in the conversation and figuring out for yourself what I take away from To Kill a Mockingbird. There is not a right answer. The lessons, the discussion, it's about the process and it's about the engagement. And who cares if when you're 50 years old somebody's mentioned some piece of literature have the confidence to say, oh, I've, I haven't read that. What is that book about? And chances are they don't know either because they've you know, memorized a couple of things. Um, so moving away from that, and then the application piece is central. So even if you've got kids figuring things out, um, it goes without saying, of course, you've got to be taking this stuff and you've got to be using it somehow. And that can be outside the classroom. In a lot of ways, that could be inside the classroom. You know, it could be a contemporary political issue can give you what you need to kind of grapple with it. To be teaching politics today and to not be talking about immigration issues or about the politics of climate control is insane. Um, so, and, and then, then clearly, especially given how divided the country is in some ways politically, um, you know, for a teacher to say, well, I'm not even going near that. I got parents that think this, I got parents that think that, or whatever. No, you're, you're, that's what makes it so rich. Um, grapple with the science, grapple with the politics, and 15, 16, 17-year-olds and, and high school graduates, they have to figure it out. They have to decide for themselves. Um, so it's Socratic, it's constructivist, it's application, and those are three things that happen in our high schools dis in small amounts and in pockets, and they happen despite the way we've structured our schools not because of the way we've structured our schools. We should have a structure in place that demands those things, that breeds those things, that affords, uh, you know, and it's about time, it's about how we manage time, it's about schedules, it's about the credit system, it's about the organization of the curriculum. You, you said, said it, Bill, you know, it's about, you know, out, getting outside the academic disciplines. Um, why have we made that so hard? because we train teachers and we organize the curriculum discipline specific ways. So when we want to connect science and politics and history, it's, it's burdensome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so wait a minute, maybe we should rethink how we've organized this so that if uh, the, the issues um, and the problems are the drivers and the disciplines feed into them rather than the other way around. Um, and that's, you often hear project-based learning. Um, and that's a, be careful with that, because there's a lot of projects that are really not about what I'm talking about here. It's about being taught something and then doing a trifold presentation in front of your parents later. That is not a project. Um, uh, the real project-based learning is when you have a problem or a question that you, with the assistance of your teacher, grapple with. 
and the teacher provides the support. You, you use learning you've already got. You discover learning that you need, you know, and that's the, the necessity is a really good driver of real learning. When a young person stum stumbles into something, and it's not I need to do this because I want to go to college, but it's I need to know this because I'm working on a problem that I care about that is relevant, and without an understanding of these geometric principles, I can't answer it. Mm -hmm. um, that's where things get really exciting. It is. I'm, I'm excited because um, certainly my area uh, giving uh, students an opportunity to get their voice out, but I think the, the uh, one of the sort of hidden benefits to doing this kind of work, visual work, is that you see the recorder too. Yeah. You see the person who's pre not only just cre presenting a finished thing, but you see the process, the yeah. relationship yeah. that's established. Uh, so I'm I'm excited about uh, about what we where we might go what yeah. might happen. Yeah. And me too. Uh, well, I've been, I've been yes. I want to be clear. I've been asked by folks in summers were like, what what are we going to do, um, or what's going to happen at the high school? The answer is I don't know. We're going to figure that out together. And I want to be clear about that. The, the responsibility is on me to lead and facilitate and provoke in healthy ways as we push forward. But if the school board and our central office and our faculty and the community of Summersworth don't buy into this, then it doesn't happen. Um, and the this is going to be something that we're going to figure out together. Exciting. Um any any other uh, things with this with this forum that that you any other topics you'd like to go into here at the start of a new school year? Um, not that it wouldn't take another hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like I've already gone pretty long. But uh, uh, it, as far as the start of the school year, um, you know, it, it, we the kids are coming in another week and a half. Um, uh, our is it that? What is today? Tuesday? Yeah, Wednesday? Another, uh, another week. week. They'll week. be here in a week. Uh, awesome. Yeah, that's exciting. I've seen a, a lot of summers, the, the, the football team, the girls volleyball team practicing, folks in and out for the student council had a meeting a couple weeks ago. I got to talk to some of the students that are involved in that. We have a new student orientation uh, tomorrow night. Um, I've been extremely impressed uh, with the students that I've met thus far, um, their questions, their thoughtfulness, uh, their engagement, um, some that are genuinely looking forward to the school year, which is a big thing because summer is a pretty good thing too. So it's okay when you kind of come in uh, regretting that the summer's over. Um, and, I, and I've also had good conversations with students that have struggled in our school. Um, and um, I think they appreciate hearing from me that I get, I get it um, because uh, we could do better in terms of how we got this set up. We got a lot of good adults uh, at Summersworth High School, um, teachers, staff, paraeducators doing phenomenal work. But the structure um, of school as we know it, um, I think, is sometimes working against, is oftentimes working against our kids. Some get through it a lot better than others. Um, but for those that are having a hard time with it, and there's oftentimes a lot of stuff going on outside of school that are making it difficult for them to get a good education. And Summersworth definitely has um, a fair number of young men and young women in that camp um, that need more than just a good high school experience. They need good support and good services that go far beyond high school. Um, and we have to do our best. Obviously, the schools can't do everything, but we usually know pretty much everything. And uh, our role in kind of making sure that they're getting uh, support and help, and, and in some cases, their parents or families need it as well. Um, we got to do everything that we can. So, uh, last question um, is a, a small one. What is success? <laughs> <laughs> what is where do we where do we see it? Where in your career, uh, where have you seen those moments? You say that's it. I, I've seen um, lots of pockets of it, and uh, I've seen young people do extraordinary things. I've seen teachers do extraordinary things. Um, I've seen phenomenal examples of what community can be. Um, I think Summersworth High School is a good school with a lot of potential, and that's what I've heard over and over again, that there are things we can do better and that we want to do better. Um, we will, in the next several months, decide together um, how we intend to measure success um, and schools schools oftentimes don't have those measures in place or they have hundreds of them so it's hard to really know what to pay attention to um, I think we can get it to five or six or seven key indicators um, so that the school board and the community understand and the faculty um, and, and the administration of the high school own it that these are the things we're really comfortable being measured on um, and my hope would be that if five years from now um, I think we're gonna have a good year this year but in terms of just kind of some of the structural stuff we want to tackle, those will be the measures. Um, 
and student surveys um, in terms of level of engagement, um, feeling connected, feeling challenged, feeling supported. Um, they're soft, but they're good indicators that measure how you do from year to year. Um, I want to see uh, more of our tests, more of our students taking the standardized tests that are necessary for college admissions. I want to see all of our students scoring better. Um, I'm not a huge fan of standardized tests as being the key measure, but I do believe um, that those 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 tests are good enough uh, and and well enough uh, aligned that if we do what we need to be doing and and do it in really non-traditional ways, as we saw happen at High Tech High in San Diego, our kids do well on those tests. And although not everybody should go to college, um, a four-year college right out of high school, I believe there's lots of paths um, out of high school, uh, two-year, four-year, work, then school, military, all kinds of opportunities. I'm pretty sure that, you know, and it's kid by kid, What uh, good counseling, good support, this is the path that you, um, we want to support you on. But I'm pretty sure we probably should have a higher percentage of our kids going on to four-year schools. Um, we should have 100% of our kids with a plan when they graduate in some form or another, not just kind of strolling out the door without a clue for what's going to happen next. Um, those average daily attendance is a good measure of engagement. Discipline, discipline in school suspensions, out of school suspensions, uh, detentions, uh, teacher referrals to the office. We track those numbers really well. All of those should be going down significantly. Yes, teenagers sometimes make bad decisions and act out at inappropriate times, but when what they're doing is relevant, purposeful, and engaging, and they get why it matters, that more than anything brings uh, uh, a sense of community and a sense of good expectations down, you know, to a place where you want them. Um, so we're going to tackle that in a lot of ways. So I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with uh, uh, there's lots of good measures, but let's agree on what they are, mm -hmm. what the most important ones are, and uh, go after them. Great. Well, thanks so much for coming in and, uh, and, and engaging this conversation. Thanks for having me. I'd be happy to come back after we've uh, been at Summersworth a little bit. Uh, yeah, gotten a little further along in this process here in Summersworth. And I'm really delighted to be a part of this community, um, being downtown several times, the teetotaler next door. Um, there's a lot of good energy, and it's a small enough community that um, even being new to it, um, I've been in the area for a long time, um, but I've often I know Dover, I know Rochester, I know the, the Berwick's across the river, but I, I haven't spent that much time in Summersworth, and I really feel connected um, already. These um, 10 square miles. These 10 square miles, they're, they're, little, they're more manageable, and the, everybody seems to know everybody, which, which is good. It keeps us all in line, um, but it's, uh, there's a lot of good energy here, a lot of really good energy, um, and I've heard that many times from folks just uh, on the cusp of kind of being whatever it, it means uh, next for the city. Yeah, great. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Awesome.